Should we go ahead and get started then, John? Yeah, why not? We have 10. That's a nice round number. And uh, all right, so welcome, everyone. Believe it or not, you are the inaugural group of GW Coders, so congratulations for, <laughs> for joining us. Um, this is our first meeting ever, um, and it's sort of a new experiment, and we're going to see uh, how things go. So thanks for joining, and, uh, and hopefully this, is a, this will be a helpful group for, for everyone involved. Um, so my name is John, John Helveson. I'm in um, engineering management and systems engineering. I've been here at GW for just two years, and I teach coding courses, uh, mostly in R, so I'm an R evangelist. Um, and um, as I started teaching more and more, uh, I got a lot of students who got to the end of my classes and, and sort of said, okay, now what? And like, what do we do next? And, you know, I want to use these coding skills and how should, you know, how, where can I go next? So that's kind of one of the main origins of this idea was we wanted to connect people. Uh, we wanted, you know, students who are learning how to code to find connections to other opportunities outside of class to practice, to get better, to do uh, research opportunities. Um, and that was sort of the, the main idea. And then I met Ryan, who had basically a very similar, hi Ryan, <laughs> uh, very similar, you know, thoughts, um, you know, let's, let's do something. So let's just put something together. So we came up with this group. Um, we were supposed to meet in the spring, but you know, COVID, et cetera. So here we are now online. Um, but eventually one day we do hope to be able to, you know, meet up in person and do sort of like live coding sessions and uh, practice things. Um, and we do actually even have a dedicated space um, in the innovation center that we're going to hopefully be able to use once things open again. So uh, for now we'll be virtual, um, but one day we'll be in, in person and when we're in person, we'll get pizza. So, or something like that, you know, so we'll, We'll get yeah, to that's the sad thing. Here. We actually had someone who was going to buy pizza for us, and now we could never take advantage of it. Yeah, we, this is like, we actually have the funding for the pizza, and I was very disappointed <laughs> to lose the pizza. Uh, so we bumped it back to 11 instead of noon, so you can eat lunch after afterwards. Uh, anyway, that was, um, so that's, that's me. I'll let Ryan introduce himself as well here. Yep, so I'm Ryan, uh, Ryan Watkins. I teach in the Graduate School of Education um, I just realized the other week that this is my 19th year at GW. So I've been at GW for quite a while. Um, and as John mentioned, we got together after he arrived and we had several conversations. And one of the pieces that kept coming up for us was how do we build more of a culture around coding at the university? Uh, we have courses going, we have workshops being offered. We have the Innovation Center applying some of it, but it never seemed to really coalesce around a group that could really share and build networks and the types of things that we really benefited from when we were coding, um, just getting started. And we continue to benefit from today. Um, we have our own personal networks of people we can go to when we can't get a library to work or we don't quite know how to approach a problem. And we said, that's something that we should develop. Um, so we came up with the idea behind GW Coders as an informal group to do this. Um, so this is not anticipated to be a formal setting. Uh, we hope that people can share ideas, laugh, and just enjoy coding like we do. I'd say our three primary goals that we have for the group, um, the first one is this idea of sharing of uh, both learning from each other and sharing the things that we're learning. Um, so this is good for beginners, people who know a little, or people who are more experienced. Uh, and we hope that everyone feels like they can participate in all of that. Uh, sometimes you might be the learner and you're learning something new that you haven't done before. Uh, but if you learn something new, we want you to bring it to the group too and say, look, I just learned about this great new library that I can use in R, or Python, or Java, and it lets us do this really cool thing. Um, it doesn't have to be a big formal lecture or anything, but just show and tell of 
the interesting things that you're finding that are helping you do your work, whatever it is, a little bit better. The second goal is really to develop some co-working um, where we can connect students, as John said, who are learning to code and are looking to kind of take it at one step further after they've taken a class or while they're taking their classes and connect them to faculty or other students who are doing projects. So those may be research projects that faculty are leading that could benefit from coding. Um, it could be a group working with the Innovation Center on a new app that they're gonna put into the i competition that the university runs every spring um, for innovative ideas that have the potential to be startup businesses. Um, but really helping people just connect so that if you're working on a project and you want to find others who might be able to help you with the coding aspects of it, you have a group to go to and a network that you can tap into, which then is the third. So we have sharing, co-working, and then the third goal is the community building and networking. Um, just to help you get to know others, uh, especially during COVID now, I think having a network of students that maybe aren't in your classes, but share some of your interests um, is really essential to having a good experience this year. And so hopefully we can help provide some of those networking opportunities so that you can get to know some of the other people on campus doing really cool and interesting things like you're doing. So today's session will be a little different than what we plan um, for the other weekly ones, but we wanted to start off um, just to have a round of introductions so that we could see and get to know who else is with us and what are some of your interests. So what we are thinking is um, we would just go down the participants list. Um, so I think we all see it in the same order. I see Ryan, John, Alexandra, Dan. Um, and if you could just give your name, um, what major you're in or what department you're in if you're not a student. Um, we hope to have faculty and students. I guess also if you're at GW, we've also invited students from Howard to join our group and hopefully we'll have them from time to time joining us. They have their own group and I'll talk a little bit about that later as well. Um, so your name, your major, where you're currently located. So where are you taking classes from? Are you here in DC or are you at home somewhere else um, in a different time zone potentially? And then maybe just uh, one or two words, um, how you would describe your coding experience. Um, do you have no experience? Are you a novice? Do you have some experience? Um, are you advanced? Have you been doing a lot of coding for a couple of years now? And that will help us as we try to develop good programming. Uh, so just to model it, I'll say real quick again. So I'm Ryan Watkins. I'm in the Graduate School of Education. I am currently in my nine-year-old bedroom. Um, and underneath, I think that's Jupiter above me that hangs from his ceiling. Uh, but we live outside of DC in Vienna, Virginia, near Tyson's Corner. Um, as far as my coding experience, I would say I'm somewhere between some experience and a good deal of experience. Um, definitely not advanced. I learn as I go. I have no formal background in coding. Um, I just pick it up because it lets me do cool and interesting things. So you're up next, John. Right, so I'm John Helveston. Um, I'm in EMSE. And uh, prior to coming here, um, I was at Carnegie Mellon in engineering and public policy. That's where I did my PhD. Um, and I am currently downstairs in my room. Uh, this is like a downstairs office room we sort of created for the COVID world. And there's a toddler and a baby screaming upstairs. So occasionally you might hear that. Um, let's see, coding, I'm mostly an R user, as I said, uh, I also have, very limited actual like coding training. I took a single programming in Python course in my entire education. 
I've never taken an R course and now I teach R courses. So I guess that's how it goes. Um, so I use it, yeah, just because it's, I use it constantly in my research and I also use it in teaching. So I like, I send my students automated emails and stuff through R. Like it's just a tool for, <laughs> for my daily life now. Um, so I'm somewhat more advanced in R and I'd say sort of intermediate Python or programmer and nothing else really. Alexandra, if you want to unmute, then you can do your intro. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Alexandra. I am a GW student in the School of Business, um, where I'm majoring in business analytics uh, with a concentration in international business and then a minor in computer science. And um, currently, I am in Houston. So that's where I'm from. So I'm taking classes there. And um, my programming, I would say uh, I took a class last semester um, in Java, and now uh, two of my classes this semester, we're going to be focusing on Python and R, but more specifically for um, analytics and visualizations. Great. Um... Yeah, hopefully you'll be able to bring some of those things that you're learning and some of your challenges to the group and um, we can help connect you with others. Dan, do you want to go next? Sure. Hi, I'm Dan Kirshner. I'm a senior software developer and librarian at GW in, in the library. Um, I've also done some adjunct, adjunct instruction with the School of Public Health this summer where I was teaching R as applied to um, public health. And I'm also a, a graduate student now in the biostatistics graduate program. So I'm taking some coursework kind of in the, the mathematical uh, foundations of statistics. Um, I also, a lot of uh, what I do with um, my colleagues, Laura and Dulce, who are, will speak later is um, we teach workshops for introductory level coding. Um, I teach in Python and in R. In my distant past, I've done languages like Java and C++ and always curious to pick up new languages as it gives you a perspective on the ones that you already know. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to think what else. Oh, and. Um, I am in the DC area. I'm in Silver Spring, Maryland, but really miss uh, being downtown. Great. Thanks, Dan. And I see that DJ posted um, to the discussion chat room uh, because of some audio trouble. Yeah, I got an email from our kids' school saying that Verizon is having trouble along the East Coast today with network issues. So that might be related to it. So you can read. Um, the introduction there, and we'll move on to Dulce. Hi, I'm Dulce Smith. Uh, I am also a librarian um, at GW Libraries, um, where I do software development primarily in Python, um, also some JavaScript and SQL. Um, and I uh, teach workshops, um, as Dan mentioned, this semester, um, I'll be leading the workshops on using Python for APIs and Python for natural language processing. Um, in terms of background, I also, like others, um, lack formal education in um, writing code, but I've been doing it for um, about six or seven years now, um, self-taught um, and taught by the uh, generosity of colleagues. And I am in DC. Oh, great. So thanks. And up next, we have uh, House Sun. Hi, uh, this is House Sun. Nice to meet you guys. And uh, um, my major is mechanical engineer, engineering, and this is my fourth year in GW. I'm a senior a PhD student in mechanical engineering. and. Um, mostly, I used the Fortran 95 to do my research, <clears throat> and 
since this year, I want to learn something about Python. So I use Python to build the uh, deep learning networks to do some research. And I'm not really good at, at Python right now. So I want to learn something about Python. And also, I learned something about the data science and the visualization. I hope to uh, uh, find my career path in industrial, not in academia. So that is why I want to learn something from you guys and hope we can have fun together. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Um, I think Laura, you're up next. Hey everyone, um, I'm Laura Rubel. I'm a librarian also um, over normally in Gelman Library, but right now uh, I'm outside of DC in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, let's see, so I use, I've learned Python on the job. Uh, so like many of us, uh, not formally, but learning what I needed to learn as, we, as we've gone along and I really enjoyed it. Um, I teach intro level Python workshops as well with my colleagues and we also offer coding consultations through which you can book through the library website. So if you're getting stuck on something that's a, we're a resource that's also available to you. Uh, I, Python, there's always something new to learn and so many things you can do with it. So I really enjoy um, inter learning from all of you who are students here about what's really interesting right now and what's the thing that you really want to learn. So that's hoping, something I'm hoping to hear more about to guide me in my own learning with Python. Brian, you might have been muted. I think it's Natasha next. No? I can oh, go. If... Yeah, sorry. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Natasha. I'm currently a first year grad student in uh, the data science program at GW. I have very limited um, coding skills. I am coming from more of a policy background. Um, I graduated from American University back in 2018 with a degree in international relations. So I was looking, you know, to network with people, not just in my program, but also outside of my program um, and just try and meet and learn from everyone. So I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I have to connect you. One of my doctoral students, she did sociology at American and then came to GW for data science. Oh, yeah, that'd be very great. similar type of background. So. Yeah. Um, is it? Puyan. Yep. Um, my name is Puyan. Uh, I'm actually a senior in undergrad. Um, I'm a yeah, senior undergrad in um, CCAS, I'm a neuroscience major. Um, I would say I actually moved from biomedical engineering for three years. So I have some maybe novice experience in MATLAB and Python. So I'm looking to improve and I am living in DC currently downtown. So nice background though. Thank you. Himalayan. So. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <good>. <laughs> um, Ruben, you're up next. Hello. Um, my name is Ruben. Um, I'm from Danville, California. So nice and early for me. Um, and I'm a computer science major um, at GW right now. I'm uh, currently a sophomore. Um, so most of the CS curriculum at GW, um, with the exception of like one databases class that's mostly SQL, focuses on Java and C. Um, but before I ended up coming here, um, I did try and like do a little bit of self-teaching and stuff like Python and R, because frankly, those are a little less painful to code in than Java and C. Um, and just because they're pretty versatile languages too. I'm also a systems administrator for the cybersecurity club on campus. So if any of you guys are interested in that stuff, or if we want to do something with that, feel free to hit me up. Um, but I'm, I'm really, really interested in sort of like, I guess, how computer science is taught, um, sort of the levels of abstraction and how we can make it accessible, because I really do think it's a super powerful tool that can do a lot of good in the world if we use it right. Yeah, I think you're amongst friends with that belief that we can make it in many different domains, I think, as we're seeing, we have people from the social sciences, people from the STEM sciences, and we can all find different uses for the same tools. 
And we'll end with you, Sarah. Yeah, nice to meet you, everyone. My name is Sarah. I'm a senior at the Elliott School studying international affairs with a minor in Spanish. Um, and I'm back in DC on Foggy Bottom in an apartment. Um, I also have very limited knowledge in coding. Um, I think the first and only experience I have was at this like hackathon that George Hex um, hosted. And me and this other girl that I met, we got like the newcomers like award because <laughs> we had no idea what we were doing and they're just very nice to give us Alexa. Um, but yeah, it was really fun and I honestly don't remember much from it. So I'm excited to be here and learn from everyone here. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah, I think we all remember when it was our first time. And if you could get into an environment where you're supported, then you'll keep with it. Uh, and so I think hopefully we can create that for people who uh, are just getting started as well as those who are trying to advance a little bit further. So if we have anyone else come in, John, let me know and we can have them introduce themselves. Uh, just to give you an idea of what John and I were thinking for the weekly format. So we do plan to do this every Friday. Um, from this point forward, other than holidays, obviously. Um, and hopefully at some point we'll be back on campus and we can do it together in person because there is something nice about being together, but we'll do the best we can with this format. So our current thinking is at the beginning of each week, we'll do some news and updates. This could be about new workshops being offered through um, the LAI, which is Libraries and Academic Innovation Center. It could be new things that are going on at the university um, that we thought everyone should be aware of. Um, then we'll take about 10 minutes or so each week and ask for one or two people to present on projects that they're working on. Um, and this could be looking for volunteers. Um, so we then I try to invite faculty who have talked with us and said that they could really use some people with some coding skills for projects that they're doing. Uh, so it could be other students. It could be, as I said earlier, that a group of students is working on a George Hack type thing, or they're planning to enter the competition for innovation um, competition that we host each spring through the National Science Foundation. So we'll take a couple minutes each time to kind of help look for projects. And then if you're looking to develop skills in that area, you can volunteer to join that project. Uh, sometimes we may use the time together on Fridays for that, but my guess is most of that work would be done outside of this group, but it would be connecting and then using tools to work together to um, achieve whatever the goals of that project are. So then about 15 minutes in, we want to do some of the sharing co-working for about a half an hour each week, we think. Um, and this, as we're initially thinking of it, we'll take one of two formats. One format is more of an interactive learning live coding type of format. So this would be where we're trying to help everyone um, test out something maybe with some code. And we have some tools for doing that and John saying go over what tools we use. But the idea is this would be live coding where we together as a group might um, do some coding and see how it goes and talk about some of the issues. Uh, for example, maybe using a library that we hadn't used before and talk about some of the uses for that. Then the other type is more of a show and tell presentation type, where it's maybe less interactive learning and more focused on showing us what you're doing and using. Um, and that could come from R, Python, it could be C, though. I'm not sure if that many of us work in C++. Um, but whatever it is that you're doing that you think others might be interested in, and then have you present for 10 or 15 minutes and then have some questions and discussions where we can talk about how it might be useful um, in other projects. 
so those could take us in many different directions. But again, we hope that everyone feels comfortable enough with the group to volunteer um, to share what you're doing. Um, so that it's not just a couple of faculty coming in and just sharing what we're doing, but this is really intended to be a collaborative group of everyone who's involved, more so than in a faculty led. Um, even though John and I are getting it started, um, we fully anticipate that everyone will be involved. Then at the end of each weekly meeting, we plan to break into groups for more of a networking type of opportunity. We know that the format with 15, 20, 25 of us in this type of a group, it's good for some things, but not as good for others. Um, so our idea is that we'll break into some discussion rooms and those could be organized around language. So it could be like a Python group in our group. It could also be focused around use. So we could do like a group that wants to talk about GIS stuff. Um, I know that Dr. Mann um, from the geography department is planning to join us some weeks. And so, and he knows a great deal more than I do about GIS um, and coding for GIS applications. So we'll take the lead though from you as the members of the group as to what we think those breakout groups should look like. And then we'll organize those so that we can get together in smaller groups and talk about specific things. Um, th those groups then you can share challenges you're having. So for example, it would be a great place to bring if you're having trouble with a piece of code that just you can't get through it, you keep getting errors. You could bring that, um, show it to the group, and then they could help you figure out what are the solutions for that. Um, so we'll try to have people who have some troubleshooting skills in the different languages as members of those groups. An hour will go quickly, so we'll try to do our best to manage that time. Um, but then we'll leave the groups open as well. So if people want to continue on through lunch and have a longer discussion, uh, there's no reason it has to end exactly at noon. Uh, but if you have other commitments, you can always leave. Uh, at noon too. So that's what we're thinking. We'll give that a shot for at least the fall, we think. And then depending on what's happening in the spring, if we're together in person in some format, then we may change it up a little. Um, or we may make changes if it doesn't seem to be working or if we have to extend the group to meet a little bit longer, we're open for that. Do we have any? I think we have someone. Yeah, new I was going to say, I saw two people join. So before those who just joined, we did a whole round of introductions. So, um, oh, we have three, another person joining. Um, so I'll say, I think it's an Anik. Can you give a quick intro, like your name, major What's department, been? and uh, some little background of any whatever coding experience you might have had and where you live, where you're at right now. Okay. Not everyone's in DC. Cool, so uh, you can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay, so cool. So I am a PhD student in George Washington University and I'm in mechanical engineering department. And I started my PhD in 2018. So it has been two years now. So most of my work is based on computational science. So I'm still learning how to code. We use Python and Fortran. Uh, I haven't used R before, so I want to learn a little bit more about how to efficiently code and also make new friends as well. <laughs> yeah, so that is all about Great, me. thanks. Yep, perfect. I'm always happy uh, to hear people who want to learn about R because that's my, that's my jam. <laughs> so, cool, welcome. Uh, I saw Mikhail Khan, I think. Do you want to give an intro if you're here? Yep, that's me. Uh, okay. You guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah, so my name is Mikhail Khan. Uh, I'm a junior studying mechanical engineering at GW. And uh, the reason I joined GW Coders was to like find out more about this organization and learn to code a bit more. I've taken like two courses at GW, like for Python. But apart from that, 
haven't taken like Java courses that, or anything like that. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Great. Um, and is it Arushi? Hello. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, great, great. Yes, um, my name is Arushi and I'm a master's student in data science at GWU. I'm a first year's master's student. And um, I think my experience with coding has been um, a little bit in my undergrad and in my previous master's, which was in econ. I, am a, I have done Python, R, and Stata. Uh, but I'm looking to learn more and um, actually want to be an expert in Python. And I also want to like uh, make sure I involve myself in more practical applications of coding. So that's why I wanted to join the community and just familiarize myself with more challenges. So yeah, that is the reason why I wanted to get involved with GW Coders. And what else can I tell you about me? I guess, where are you? Like physically located? I am from India, but currently I'm in DC. Okay. Yeah, I'm near campus, yes. Uh, good. Um. Yep, those are all the new names I see for right now. I think that was everyone. Um, we do have, so I think it was Natasha is also a master's in data science here starting. So there's a few of you in that specific program. Um, so that's another thing we were hoping to do is like by doing some of these intros and just meeting some other people in your program because it's very hard to meet right now. I don't know who's in my program because I don't, I don't see them. Um, so hopefully y'all can uh, connect. Um, I'm also amazed like the diversity of languages and everything here. It's really cool. I mean, I didn't expect to have Fortran in the group, but hey, welcome Fortran. I mean, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so I, there's actually more than, I think there was two people who mentioned Fortran. They're, they're using Fortran. Oh, really? That's really cool. So I yeah. Friend, I suppose, yeah. So I you're not alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, I guess uh, one of the things I wanted to do is go over a few different tools that we could use. Um, just, just so like if we if we end up doing a some sort of a a session where we spend 20, 30 minutes like teaching an idea or going over some idea, it's hard to do this virtually. It's I think it's often easier when we're in a room and you can just like see my computer projected and uh, we can do some you know live real time coding. So we've been exploring new tools uh, to try to help with that issue. So I'm going to show a few um, just so you all know what they are. Um, but the first are, are pretty straightforward. Like obviously we're using Zoom, right? Like, and I think this link should be the same every week. We should just use this link and we'll join this meeting. Um, the other though is Slack. So if you haven't used Slack or you're not on it yet, um, I'm going to see, let me just create a little like invitation link in case you don't copy invite link and I'm going to post it here in the chat. So if you haven't joined our Slack, I encourage you to do so because this is another way to just message each other sort of asynchronously. Um, you can chat with each other, you can send each other direct messages, but there's a bunch of other channels too that are um, like hashtag something like announcements, hashtag events volunteer opportunities. Um, and so people can just post whatever here. And this is this is a place where, you know, I'm hoping people can connect over all sorts of different um, like uh, similar, you know, goals and initiatives. And you can also make your own channels. I mean, if you want to make a channel about like Fortran issues, like cool, go for it. And you can post whatever you want there. So, so hopefully this is a place where, and there, there's already a ton of people in this, uh, this group. I think there's something in the 80s or so now. Um, yeah, 81 people now in it. So this is beyond us. And that's partly because we've also been using this group um, to uh, do communications within. Um, now, now everyone's joining right now and my thing is blowing up over here. Uh, I'm getting messages in my ear. Um, so they've been using this with the GW library. So Laura and her course that she's been running and others that 
we're using Slack to manage communication for that. So we're getting other people here that are beyond just the folks in the room with us right now. So hopefully this is another place that'll continue to get larger and people can connect with each other uh, that way. Yeah, I also you want to let them in, John, I can talk a little bit more about the tools if you want to, you have to let people into the room. Um, I think that one thing that we're hoping oh, to see. with the Slack, um, as many of you have probably found, the workshops through the libraries, they fill up very fast. I think the new Python one was like three and a half hours before it was full. Yeah. Um, so hopefully by getting those types of messages through Slack first, it gives you a little bit of a faster chance of getting into some of those workshops when they get announced. Um, I'm not sure if they can announce them here first, but Laura and Dan, if you, <laughs> Dulce, if you could announce them on Slack first, that would be great to give this group a little bit of a heads up so they can get to it before. Because uh, I know those are filling up really quickly, especially with out people being on campus, they're trying to connect to those resources. Uh, so we'll use Slack for all that type of communications throughout the week as well. Yeah. Um, so those, that's probably going to be our main communication channel. It's, it's just so much easier to connect and you don't have to know like my email and be like, dear professor, help us. And just say like, hey, John, what's up? Uh, that's how I hope we can all talk. Uh, and this is how I work with my students in my class too. Like I have a Slack for my class and it just, it, it works nice, nicely. So I'll show a couple other tools um, for doing some coding in real time. So I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully we can see these. And I'm gonna start with uh, DeepNote. So I'm gonna post this as well. You might wanna check this out, deepnote.com. It's kind of a cool uh, platform. Um, so hopefully you can see what I'm looking at here. It's basically like a Jupyter notebook. It's like a Google Doc version of a Jupyter notebook, right? So you can have, so if you've seen Jupyter notebooks before, if you know what that is, this will look very familiar. If you've never seen a Jupyter notebook, you're going to go, what am I looking at? Um, but it's basically a way for you to edit a combination of text and code and execute the code in real time. And because it's through this platform, the DeepNote platform allows you to sort of um, jointly work on something. So this is a, a little thing we were just like playing around with. Um, and Ryan and I are both on this uh, same notebook. So we can like write text to each other. I don't know, whatever. And then, you know, whatever. Um, and so that's, that's gonna be there, but then he can go back and edit it too. And then we can also edit code. Like here's a code snippet and we can edit some code. And um, so, you know, this is another, it's, an, it's a really nice tool for learning because we can all like sort of interactively work on um, text and code and leave ourselves comments and explain what we're doing with text. Um, and it's also free. So, you know, I, at least for now, uh, I encourage you to check it out, play around with it. It's a fun platform. Um, this is primarily Python oriented, which is sort of, I think, true most of the time with Jupyter is Python is the default language, but it does have support for other languages. Uh, it's just a little bit trickier to set that up. So if you're going to work in Python, I would encourage you to work with, with DeepNo. I think it's a nice platform. Ryan, is there anything you wanted to mention about it as well? Or do you want to, you can join this notebook and edit it in real time, but it, it looks like people editing a Google, Google doc with you ever seen that? Yeah, um, I think it'll be helpful. We also have a Jupyter Hub at GW, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, which is nice in that everyone has access to Jupyter. Um, and if you don't have the link to it, but are interested, you can just um, send me a note in Slack and I'll send you the link. Uh, but this, again, allows for that real-time collaboration like a Google Doc which we thought would be valuable for this type of a group where we can bring code up and people can edit and collaborate on it at the same time. Yeah, so, so this is one tool. Um, the other I'll mention for, oh, we have someone joining. Sorry, if I, I don't know how long we've been waiting. Um, the other tool I'll mention is, uh, I can't click on it because my thing's in the way. There, move. RStudio. 
so for the R users, we put this together over the summer. Um, so I'll send this link, but uh, you won't be able to use it unless you're on the GW network. So to do that remotely, you have to get on the VPN. Um, so there's um, a specific way here. I'm going to the chat window here so you can see it. Okay. And Laura also said, oh, we can invite you to our, okay, so there you go. Laura's saying you, you can get, a, you'll get stuck on the wait list for access to DeepNote, but we can, we can invite you. So we can, you can get automatic access. So yeah, message Ryan and he can invite you. Um, so the R Studio is just the same thing as R Studio, but in the cloud. So if you're an R user, you know you can download R Studio and use it on your computer. But you can also log in with your GW ID. So this is only for people at GW who have a GW ID, and you have to be on the network. So I'm currently on the VPN, so this will work for me. But it, it's just a cloud computed, computing version of R Studio. So it looks exactly the same as R Studio, but it's in the cloud. But very similarly to Deep Note you can share projects with each other. So it's another kind of nice way to, to collaborate on code um, where, you know, I can go to my sort of home files and create a shared folder. And, and then in that folder, we can in real time edit the same, you know, I'm editing this and someone else can be editing at the same time. So I've used this with projects where um, I also have um, student projects that are in my courses that will be working on the same project. And it makes it a lot easier. So you don't have to have like five versions of the same file that you're emailing back and forth. You can just sort of edit in real time. So those are at least two ways to do some real time editing and sharing um, of code of at least in R and Python. Um, this one is a bit more restricted, but um, you know, if you can get on the GW VPN, you, you should be fine. Um, and then I guess the only other tool that I want to mention is GitHub in case you've never used it. I use it all the time for most, uh, most things I do. I just post everything to GitHub, but, um, in GitHub, I feel like it can be an intimidating place to get started because it's sort of a weird, sort of a weird, uh, entity, like what this thing is. Um, but you know, go to GitHub, create an account, it's free. And then you can, basically you're just storing files in places. So you know, I have a project that I'm working on. Uh, I just store a bunch of files in, in a repository. And then that, here's a bunch of repositories. These are all the different projects I'm working on, uh, things from many, many years past. And you know, I can go into any of them. Um, so here's one I'm working on with some collaborators. In California, we're, we're looking at learning curves in the solar power industry. And so you can see a bunch of stuff like we have code files in here that we're working on. Here's some code for making plots, right? And once I make an edit, I can just post it here and then they'll see my edits. So this isn't real time. It's not like one of these other two platforms where I can sync uh, in real time, but it's more like I do some work and I send it up into the cloud and then they over there can download it and see my changes and allows us to sort of keep track of versions. So as we, as we make major changes in the code, we can go back and see it. Um, this probably requires like, like a whole day where we just spend one of our lessons learning how to use Git. And I we probably will do that at some point. Um, and I know the library also offers tutorials on that as well. So it's a super useful tool. Um, but there's a bit more of a learning curve to figure out like what it is. Um, but also I just want to mention like if you, if you want to use Git, like you don't have to sort of like the, the prime, the main way people have used it in the past was like through the terminal. So it looks really hardcore because you just like, uh, open up your terminal and write Git commands. I am not that hardcore. I use a, a GUI interface. So I use GitHub desktop, which looks like this. So I can see all my projects and just click buttons to send things back and forth to GitHub. So don't feel like you always have to write code. Um, that's what we're doing in CS right now. What the, the terminal version or, or just Git in general? Uh, this is Ruben I'm responding to. Oh, just hard terminal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, so I, I don't really understand. Uh, I think a lot of the introduction to Git is very much like, here's the terminal, let's go. And I find it kind of uh, unintuitive for some people. And for myself, it's quite unintuitive. So I, I use the, I, I use the, the GUI interface because it's, it's nice and it works fine. Um, and I'm also, I'm just reading the chat in, in live time here. Also one of my, oh, Google Collaborate. Uh, yes, Google Collaborate, excellent point. Yeah, I use Google that? Colab um, fairly often because it's very, very fast. Uh, and you get pretty much the best Google servers to run your stuff on. Uh, the only problem with Google Collaborate is every night your stuff goes away. So you can't store things there. So you're always creating new. Uh, but I know a lot of people use it like if they want to test out a machine learning piece and they want it to run really quickly. Um, it's a great free tool that Google makes available uh, to use that. So we may end up using that some. Um, it, do you have more experience with it, Dulce? Um, probably not. Uh, we, we tend to use it in our workshops um, since it's just easier for folks to get started with than a Jupyter Notebook environment on their own machine. Um, but yeah, I, I had in mind the same thing you said, which is if you if you do want to try anything out with machine learning or or deep learning, um, they do have those. They have a GPU available in the basic um, free version that you can opt to run your code in. Um, which you know for most of, for a lot of us is probably not something we have access to on our laptops. So it's it's good to know about for that purpose too. Yeah, I was doing some coding with audio editing, and it would not run outside of it because to edit audio, it just re it was merging lots of big files. Um, so I just started using Colab for that. And it worked really well because, again, you could go to the GPU and it has no RAM problems at all. Um, so yeah. those are some of the tools we'll be using. And we can find others as we go as well. Um, so if other people have recommendations. Uh, we're tool agnostic. We use whatever tool is best at the time. Well, at least I am, John. You may be stuck with R Studio. Yeah. <laughs> uh, R has a bit more of a, I would say, maybe dedicated IDE. The R Studio is sort of the main way people will interact with R. But other, you know, Python and other languages, there's a whole slew of, of, of tools for working with the language. I don't really know many people who just work in the terminal with it. I feel like that's extra hard, <laughs> but I don't know, for some, uh, if the longer you've been doing it, maybe, but uh, maybe it works for you. But I, I sort of lean towards, you know, if there's a GUI interface and it works well, then use it. And um, if there's not, then we have to write more code. Um, so <laughs> that's, my, that's my take on it. But um, I did notice that we had one more person join, um, Nathalia. I went, before you joined, we've all gone through and done introductions, just said like our name, our major slash department and maybe any coding experience you have or you're looking to gain. So do you want to Hi, give an yes, intro? Yes, thank you. Sorry. I, I'm currently a teacher, so I was kind of between my one of my classes and ah. like getting here. So I apologize for being late. Uh, but yeah, so I graduated from DW 2019 with a biophysics major. So I did some like intro to Java, very, very basic. And then I like kind of try to teach myself Python for a summer. It didn't really work out well. Um, but I understand a little bit of the terminology that's used, but practice, I have none, and I consider myself a bad coder, so I guess that's what also why I'm here. Um, and then I am teaching at Woodrow Wilson now, and I still collaborate with the physics department uh, with some research, so I just kind of want to learn a few things about um, like how to, work, how, about how to go about coding for research and also education. Wonderful. Welcome. Thank you. Um, all right. So, so we're also, um, I think, you know, we're, we're trying to connect people from like all sorts of different entities and not just at GW, even though we're called GW coders, we're just, we're, you know, we're trying to look everywhere for people who code and uh, I sort of feel with bigger networks are better. Um, so we have like partnerships, uh, with other groups. Ryan, do you want to go through and talk a little bit about some of the other folks we're working with? Yeah. Um, so, of course, when we first had the idea, 
for coders. John and I thought we were unique and this will be the only group in the world like this. And then we go to Google and we find out there's a lot of other people doing similar type groups. Um, one of those groups, as it turned out, is called Emerging Coders and they're based at Howard University. Um, so just around the corner from us. So we've been talking with the president of their organization in terms of how to collaborate. Um, their focus is a little different in terms of their basic model is they teach coding workshops in the fall and the students who take those as the payback for taking free workshops in the spring, they volunteer to mentor uh, high school girls who are learning to code um, through the Girls Inc. program. So it's kind of a give and take model. You get in the fall to learn how to code and then you give in the spring by introducing others. Um, so we'll be trying to collaborate with them, potentially having some of their students um, present at our sessions and trying to get them involved. Uh, they're just getting started for this semester as well. So I don't think we have any this week with us, but we're gonna continue to push on that collaboration. Um, at GW, we have quite a few groups working around coding um, and different aspects of it. So we're also um, in touch with the GW Data Club, which is a GW-wide official student organization. Um, so we're an unofficial meetup group. We're not planning to do an official organization around GW coders. But if you're interested in getting involved, um, I know the GW Data Club is always looking for members. Um, they're probably about, I'd say, 16 to 20 core members at any given point in time. And the group gets fairly large, um, but it's a mix of students, uh, many out of business and business analytics, some out of C's and engineering, and some from elsewhere. We're also partnering with the GW Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Um, they run the i program at the university, which is an innovation competition housed each year where students propose ideas and look to get startup funding. Um, and a lot of those come out of coding projects. So they're um, eager on building this community and culture around coding at the university as well. Um, we're also working with the Office of Undergraduate Research, um, especially around our efforts to get students engaged in research coding uh, projects with faculty. That's one of their big initiatives. As you heard, we have good representation from the Library and Academic Innovations Group, who offered the majority of the workshops and seminars and tutorials and mentoring on coding for the university. Um, so we're glad to have them partnering with us on this part of it too. Um, in terms of further expanding into projects that people can work on, over the summer, John and I met with the people who run the Nashman Center for Civic Engagement. And they have lots of public goods projects that are going on at the university um, and could probably use coding skills. So if you're interested in trying to apply some of your developing skills to projects, we can connect through them who can link you to uh, public service projects that are already ongoing and could um, you could jump right in and start to try some things out. And if you run into problems, you can bring them back to this group on Fridays and we can help you move forward with them. Uh, so we hope that this group can be a support network for when you're out there trying to do coding on projects. A couple other groups that we're working with, um, there's a new Institute of Data Democracy and Politics, and they're doing a lot of data work around the elections. Um, and so if people are interested in that, we can connect you with projects that they have ongoing as well. GW also has an innovation center, which is our maker lab space. So if you're interested more in like CircuitPy or 3D printing and those types of things, um, this would be hopefully a group for making connections. Um, 
I'm not sure exactly how they're doing it during COVID, but they actually do have space and materials um, that you could use to actually make things. Um, and then last is our uh, department areas, are the Graduate School of Education and the School of Engineering and Sciences um, are our other partners behind these initiatives. So it's a big group, as you can tell, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot going on, but there was never really a way to connect and to informally network. And so we're hoping this group can help be that place where you can learn about what else is going on that might interest you. I'll mention one other thing. Like, I think all of us have, uh, I mean, we're all sort of linked through the university. So most of my work is like, working on my research or teaching but i mean i use coding for all sorts of other things like very strange things like designing and building mechanical keyboards i mean like i have my random hobbies like that too just so you know i mean so i printed this at the innovation center it was like 3d printed the case and soldered it and wrote the code so that i can use it um i have like bad wrist problems so i have like really ergonomic keyboards so i just designed one um so that's like completely unrelated to anything in my research, but like that kind of thing, just like finding the printer and going off and meeting some of those folks, you know, we don't all have to be uh, doing our research. Uh, so I just want to mention that there's like lots of other fun hobby things you can do with coding. So, I mean, no matter what you're interested in doing, hopefully we can all sort of get together. Um, so I noticed we're at noon and that went by really fast. Um, but we said earlier, like, none of us have hard deadlines at noon. Um, that's sort of why we set this. So if you have to go, that's fine. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next time. Um, but we can also stick around and keep chatting. Um, I mean, we'd also like to hear from you if there's any particular things you'd like us to sort of maybe seek and go out and find. Like, Ryan and I are trying to go find speakers and people who can come and either teach a workshop or just show us some of the cool stuff they're doing. Um, so let us know either now or just through Slack or whatever, just feel free to message us or you can chat right now too. <laughs> yeah. And you can feel free to unmute yourself. So this isn't like a classroom where we're trying to control. Uh, thank you for doing this. I just had a quick question. Um, so one of my friends is actually interested in joining, but she couldn't come to this, um, specific meeting um and i noticed that this is being recorded is there a way that she can see the recording in the future like will it be in the slack or is there any way yeah so i was going to plan on posting our sessions to youtube i i failed to mention that to everyone and i should have um because this is this was i didn't even actually realize i was recording that's the default setting on my thing but um um so I will plan on posting them unless people have strong like opposition and they say, please don't post this. But my goal will be to post it on a sort of unlisted playlist. So it's not searchable and things, but if you go through the Slack, you can find the link there. So pretty much, you know, people who are already sort of engaged can go back and look at it. Um, if you didn't, if you weren't able to make it to this and the future ones will probably be more helpful slash interesting. You know, you'll be able to watch the seminar or something that someone is presenting. Yeah, people can come and join at any point to it. It's not intended, like, if you weren't at the first meeting, you're not a member. It's very much a loose networking type of structure. And some weeks, you may not be able to make it. You may have something you have to do for a class, then you come back the next week. That's fine. Um, it's supposed to be this informal space where we can network and share and learn a little as we go um forward together thank you and i mentioned that there are other groups like this the toronto the university of toronto has a coders group that we're loosely basing this off of um, and they actually record their sessions and they're really interesting to watch they have lots of good tutorials on different Python and R things. Um, and I know that 
we're branching out in many directions. Um, so Laura, who was on earlier, we've been in a conversation with colleagues at the Innovation Center around doing a series of workshops through the libraries on maker coding. So looking specifically probably at CircuitPy and how to use it with Arduinos. So that if you actually want to make things like John does, so connecting to physical objects um, and probably get into some robotics areas. And then we'd be bringing the, those ideas back to this group and then sharing out from there as well. Yeah, I could do a whole week where I just talk about how to make a mechanical keyboard. I mean, why not? <laughs> but, yeah. Which by the way, I knew absolutely nothing about. I never even soldered, I knew none of this stuff. And then I just went over to the makerspace and they were like, oh yeah, like, one of the undergrad students taught me how to solder. <laughs> so <laughs> and I was like, cool, now I have a keyboard. And I have two Arduinos sitting in a box downstairs on my, my regular desk. And I never do that much with them, but I really want to. Um, or do you have a Raspberry Pi or something like that? Um, it seems like there's a thousand cool projects you could do if you can find the time and have some other people to do it with just to, my 12 year old isn't quite ready yet for that. So I look forward to when he's 14 and he is ready. Um, though he has done machine learning, which I'm proud of. Uh, he did machine learning for the first time when he was nine. I was like, woohoo. Uh, there's a good program that IBM has called machine learning for kids, which uh, is pretty cool that a nine year old is doing machine learning projects. Absolutely. I'm sorry to step in. Um, this is more on the logistics, but uh, earlier on, you guys said that we can either download the R Studio on our laptops, just like download the software, or also use the um, cloud-based one. Uh, yeah. but for that, you require like you have to set up a VPN. So, how should I go about that if I wanted to use that option? Just in terms of not overwhelming Twitter. Let me send that. Um, actually. Yeah, so if you go to the IT page, it.gw.edu, um, and you do a search, you have to download the Cisco VPN system. It's just a small download, and then when you launch it, it will ask you for your GW um, student yes. login and password. All right. I am unemployed technically, like a part-time employee, so do you think I can still get access to that? I think it's... It's set up where as long as you have a GW net ID, like okay. a GW email, then you should be able to use it. So it's, that's the only um, thing. And actually here's more details on all the R things there. <laughs> this is from my class I'm teaching right now. Um, so my, the first day of class, I tell everyone, go read this stuff, which is like, here's how you install the VPN and here's how you install R yeah, on your own I computer as well. Yeah, I went through a Google search on how to go about it, but that yeah. may be better. There you go. Yeah, I wish ours was a bit more open, but it's also, it wasn't through the university, it was through the School of Engineering Computing Facility, which now is not <laughs> non-existent. Um, it's been centralized, but, but the servers are all there. So that's actually running on a machine in the downstairs basement of the SEH building. So uh, it, it can get easily overloaded if we have like 30 people on at once, but I don't think we're ever gonna have like a ton like that. Right, so. okay, thank you. All right. Yeah. Yeah, there's also a, um, I mean, obviously having R on your desktop is good for just yeah. getting things done. Mm -hmm. um, I was also playing around with a system called R Studio Cloud, which is a private company's version. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they have, what's nice about it is it, you can have GPU access. So if you are running bigger data sets, mm -hmm. um, you could run on that because they have the bigger servers. Right. Uh, but for the most part, I think most people just use the desktop version. Um, though we'll probably try to use the online version some just so that people can code together. Right, yeah. Yeah, RStudio Cloud I used, um, it's basically the exact same thing. It's, it's RStudio's own hosting of, the, of a free cloud service and uh, I had been using it for my class, but then uh, now they're charging for it. <laughs> so, so I said, all right, we'll just build our own. And we just, but so they, they make the software, the underlying server software, they make that available for free for universities. 
So, you know, as long as you have a computer, you can, you can run it. And so that's what we built this summer. Um, but the, you know, their own free version is also um, pretty good for collaborating on projects with people. I think it's free up to five people. Yeah. And then so after that, they charge. Small size Which projects, makes sense. It, works, it works fine. Yeah, yeah. Servers are expensive. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much, guys. And I yeah. guess great. We'll, we'll see you next Friday. Mm -hmm. Bye. Hey. Bye. Thanks for joining, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, we're all head out. Thank you very much. Yeah. We'll connect soon, John. Yeah. Bye. Bye.